And I'm originally from Egypt. I came here in 1992, and uh, one of the biggest reasons I left Egypt because pretty much there was no hope there. Uh, there was no jobs. The government had been privatizing all the businesses there. It's kind of like an American model, but accelerated. They were just selling off public companies left and right. And the gap between the rich and the poor grew pretty dramatically and fairly quickly. And uh, it's, it's kind of similar to here, but here they tend to maybe disguise it a little bit better than in Egypt. In Egypt, it's really blatant. So um, I tend to visit my family quite a bit. And uh, the last time I was there was uh, actually left on the 18th of January this year, one week before the revolution. Wow. And I can tell you right now, this is a personal account. No one, absolutely no one except maybe for a few, had any inclination that there was going to be a revolution happening. We were all watching TV and looking at the Tunisian revolution, which has been going on for a month, and our jaws were just dropped. All of us were like, what did just happen? You know, and it was pretty amazing. But no one really knew that only a week later something would happen. So when I came back to the States, I saw this Facebook alert saying 25th, um, it's police day celebration, and we're gonna go out there and protest against police brutality. Because one year before, there was this young man, 20 year old Khaled Said, he was murdered by police for posting a video showing two cops divvying up drugs that they had confiscated. And, um, Literally, a couple of days later, he was bloodied up, murdered. So, people went out on the 25th of January only to protest police brutality, which is really something inspiring because when you think about it, people in the revolution are in the process of creating a revolution. They don't know what they're into. And I think we're in the same moment right now. Uh, you know, we could change just a little bit, or this could turn into a whole government topplement. We, it's kind of inspiring and kind of scary at the same time. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm gonna probably tell you a little bit of uh, more details on the Egyptian revolution, but I don't wanna just basically lecture. I want you to drive the discussion, so uh, if anyone wants to start the direction of the discussion, please raise your hand and you can answer it. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think that it was actually a revolution in Egypt or uh, a protest? I feel that their revolution is ongoing, but I feel that what they had was a protest. It's, um, the revolution is definitely still ongoing. Uh, what we're faced right now is a military that has uh, painted the picture of a protector of the revolution and completely hijacked it. Um, and now, after people had broken the barrier of fear against the police, now they have a new barrier to break, fighting people with machine guns and tanks. <laughs> so it's definitely a new bar as far as, you know, do I really want to go out there and risk my life for this? What I mean is like uh, a protest is asking for uh, a regime to reform itself. Yes. We want this, we want that, making demands. Whereas a revolution is asking to just change the system. Does anybody want to take that question? Do you know the difference between a revolution and a protest? So do you think that what happened in Egypt was just a revolution or a protest? Uh, I think that if they change you know, the social interrelation between from, the, from government to... Uh, I'm sorry, I'll speak up. Uh, I think that if they you know, change the social interreaction or interrelation from like each other and also like towards the state, then like, yeah, it would be a revolution. Uh, uh, whether or not it's a protest or a, you know a demonstration or or uh, you know any of that like I mean, that, 
seems kind of like it's a perpetual state of potential revolution if you know they're then able to throw overthrow the the military. Uh, what's the correct term for that? Like, it's, a, it's an interim government, right? I think yes, absolutely. I think that you can you can never really reach. Revolution is maybe an idealistic term. What is the end result of a revolution? When you have a utopian... Can you, uh, no. can give you an operation we use in political science, which basically, when you try to change the policy of a government, that's a protest. So don't go to war. But if you say that uh, we need to have an institutional restructuring of the system itself, that's a, considered a revolution. Okay. So in that case, it was a revolution. Yeah, no, I mean, the. If you see the uh, removal of uh, President uh, Mubarak as a as a policy, like entrenchment of Mubarak and uh, basically dynastic presidency, that is uh, like the hallmark of uh, Middle Eastern uh, countries. Is basically yeah, that is a policy that that was changed. So that was a protest against Mubarak, but it hasn't stopped. It hasn't been against. It it didn't stop there. It, it's still ongoing. The people are still going to Tahrir Square. So. And people are actually quite aware of what's going on in relations between the military and the government. And they haven't removed the, 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 the number of the seats allocated by the party, the yes, former right. part, the Mubarak's party. So yes, it is. It's ongoing, definitely. There is, we, we're supposed to be having a parliament election, parliamentary election. And um, the, the military, uh, the armed, they call, they're called the SCAF, which is the Supreme Council of Armed Forces. They keep on delaying it. And this is a tactic that's really well known in Egypt. They just basically give you small concessions and just kind of let people cool down, vent off, and then they just drag. And people just get discouraged because it takes forever. And eventually you just basically give up hope. But um, there is a protest coming up, I think, on November 18th, that is basically trying to rally people again, get them down in the street. But it's getting harder and harder each and every time. They've been arrested at least once. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that have been arrested and even, uh, well, imprisoned indefinitely. Alan's imprisoned. And, yeah. and, and the Khan's just starting a hunger strike. Right. And the, the, uh, what he just wrote from prison was that uh, he never imagined after a revolution that, that he'd be back in the bar of his prison again. And that's, in my opinion, okay, I was following many people in Egypt on Twitter. And through from January 25th on, until the uh, uh, invasion of uh, Libya. And many Egyptians were uh, against Gaddafi. They were supporting the, uh, uh, the Al-Qaeda CIA trained people who were trying to get rid of Gaddafi and who invited NATO in. Because they said Gaddafi's another dictator like Mubarak. Well, Mubarak had never given Egyptians free housing, free health care, free uh, you know, higher education. Uh, they did, didn't seem to understand that, that uh, Gaddafi gave Libyans things that I, as a U.S. citizen, can never dream of. I can't dream of free health care. It's, it's, you know. I, I don't know all the details about Libya right now. I, I know that... <laughs> He, he pretty much ruled that country with an iron fist, and he had people murdered, anybody that opposed him. Um, so it's, but again, I'm not really an expert on, on what. You, the, supposing that it's, the, it's just the, a reputation. Supposing that the NATO propaganda was true and he had murdered people, basically. compared to how many people NATO has murdered. Okay, that's a different topic. <laughs> We're not even talking about the yeah, This is supposed to be about Egypt. So, <laughs> Here's an example of Saudi Arabia. Like, it, it's not a balance sheet. I mean, you can't Libya. Gaddafi. It's like Gaddafi. You can't say Gaddafi was a good man because he gave free housing. He was repressive as hell. Just like Saudi Arabia, they're providing a lot of uh, social good for the people, but they're a very repressive regime. Same thing with Gaddafi. So I don't think comparison 
in, in manner of balance sheet, okay, uh, there's two good things here, there's one good thing here, so he's basically is a good guy, is the right approach. Fundamentally, people need to be part of the governing body. I just speak about, uh, like, I, I speak about Iran, I want to bring it back, because, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the there is there is roads being built in Iran. There are housing housing projects in Iran too. But at the same time, when there is protests happening after the election in 2009, what happened was they used the same tactic that they used in Egypt. They just let the people come on the street and then they attack them, frustrate them like that, and like create this environment of fear that the, you know you should not oppose the government. And that is a fundamentally, in a, I mean, even if you're given housing, it's basically you're getting paid to shut up. And that is against the basic of human community, the sentiments of basic human community, being in community and being self-determining self, uh, uh, your own destiny. So I don't think we should have a balance sheet because in America, they are not uh, sending tanks on the streets when the protests are happening. But that's not something that we should cheer about. That's, that's something we should expect. Like They should not even be doing what they're doing right now. But anyways. Okay, thanks, Amir. I just want to take it back to, uh, to the room. This is a question about me. Sure. I, I would be very interested to hear more insight into the military current day of Egypt. I mean, among other things, I understand they own a lot of private property from a lot of businesses, are deeply invested in a lot of ways. Uh, and so I i love to hear your opinion upon uh, what kind of force the military is now. You've already started to share some of that. Um, what, what, you, what you think their role is in the coming months, the, the hopes for, for you know, constitutional change, and what they might do with that. The Egyptian army has always been part of Egypt's uh, elites, so to speak. If you think about, if you go back 50 years or more, you'll see uh, President Gamal, he was in the military. Sadat was in the military. Mubarak was in the military, his Air Force. And then when he was ousted, the person, Tantawi, that took over, he is, he was an integral part of that group of people that were corrupt in Egypt. And when they were uh, in the trial of Mubarak, they called upon him to uh, testify against Mubarak. And he passed on that invitation. I didn't know he could do that, but he said, I'm not coming. The country needs you know, my attention right now because it's in total chaos. Well, it's not a good excuse. Uh, you yeah, my memory on this is not as fresh as it was a few months ago, but I wanted to connect the Egyptian military into the role of the United States and the policy of materials. Because I believe it was the case that Kentucky in particular had spent a significant amount of time in the United States and had a very close working relationship with uh, many of the generals and also political leaders in the United States. And in, in fact, uh, I, I think that the Egyptian strength, uh, the Arabs and the particular going on in Egypt in January and February, was causing real fear in the American ruling class about what might actually happen. And as a result, they were seriously relieved and basically one of their allies, whom they helped into power, was able to control the situation. And I, I think that that's what we're seeing as a strategy throughout the Middle East of uh, the, the role of U.S. imperialism. I mean, when, when, that what happened, I mean, I don't, I don't defend Gaddafi by any means, I, I agree with what you're saying, but the, the, the NATO intervention was an attempt to head off what other might, might very well have been a successful popular revolution in the in, in Libya that led to now the traditional national council, uh, which no longer prevents it yet. Uh, and, well, I could go on and on the whole Middle East if you got my point. Chuck? Sure. Yeah, I wanted to say about the question earlier about whether it was really a revolution or just a protest. Well, in the first few days of the, of, after January 25th, um, a, few, a few really important things happened. The, the headquarters of the NDP, the party that had ruled Egypt for decades, uh, Mubarak's party, the headquarters, a, a building probably about that size, was just torched to the ground. I mean, and I mean, that's a major 
a major action, right, to, to take to undermine a dictatorship. Um, they also, as far as I could tell, defeated the police in the streets in every major city. And so um, the police who were uh, widely hated by many, many people in the country 